so i before resuming where i left i forgot to tell you a story i said i would say something about riman i forgot about uh, right i said something about goals and then started this uh, general blah blah so the second one the gauss's memoir basically was the starting point of differential geometry as it is the first one but uh, what really revolutionized geometry and laid the foundations for modern differential geometry was the second memoir by riemann so this on some hypothesis on the foundations of geometry which lie at the foundations of geometry that's what this means right which is which uber is on so there is a story behind this uh, memoir of riemann this is what is called the i will resume this uh, thing after my story about riemann okay so this work was what was called the habilitation shrift of uh, riemann so this was in in germany so after you finish your phd thesis before you get a degree you have to submit another thing another thesis kind of another work which is called the habilitation shrift so this has to be in a an area totally different from the topic of your thesis okay so riemann's thesis was on complex function theory right as well the cauchy riemann equation riemann surfaces and all those things in fact the many the complex function theory usually three people are the most important the basic complex function theory cauchy riemann and weierstrass right cauchy always used integrals Weierstrass always used power series. Riemann used geometry. They introduced Riemann surfaces in that context, which in a way started modern geometry also. What what I have been talking about here, the, what are called manifolds that we'll come back to. But anyway, so this so for his for the habilitation shift, what you have to do is what one has to do is. suggest three topics on which you are going to give a write up this is kind of thing totally different from the topic of your phd thesis so of the three titles that the candidate gives the examiner will choose one <laughs> okay and so the candidate has to write up a thesis on that topic so so riemann gave three topics the first two he was fairly familiar with last one was 
he gave was the foundations of geometry of which he had not thought about anything he didn't know the examiner was gauss <laughs> so so gauss chose the third one so riemann had to write down a thesis on geometry so he worked for several months and came up with one of the most seminal treatises on mathematics so that is it <coughs> on hypothesis which on which uh, uh, which lie at the foundations of geometry so in that he came up with a very general kind of geometry in arbitrary dimensions so so far even until the time of gauss geometry was done only in space r3 right curves and surfaces in r2 or r3 so riemann's uh, geometry was in arbitrary dimensions and you see as long as you are in r3 or r2 you already have a uh, may have many things many tools available to you length of a curve right distance so on so so riemann introduced a very very general form of geometry on a general kind of space space is what we have been trying to uh, formulate just before the break okay and so he came up with what is called uh, now as the riemannian metric if you if you look at in even in r2 or r3 how do you define the length of a curve for example once you have a parametrized curve alpha t so what is the length of alpha alpha is defined on some interval uh, say c1 continuously differentiable or some regular thing then you define the curve as the length as a b or 0 1 whatever right so what is inside is alpha prime is what the velocity vector if you like or the tangent to the curve the point so the length of the tangent vector is what is inside so riemann came up with uh, the idea that i mean the way of defining such a thing for example in a very general setup what you need to define this how do you define length in euclidean space basically length of a vector x is given by the dot product or the inner product the usual dot product so on 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 any euclidean space there is a natural length so so this is nothing but in r3 for example if you have this there is nothing but square root of that this length so we are we are going to study some of these things a little later okay so so you have a curve you have a tangent vector and you want to measure the length of that tangent vector right in mean, whatever space you are looking at so how do how do we compute the length of the tangent vector for that what we have is some inner product on the tangent set of tangent vectors okay that's what we have in the in our setting in r3 or any euclidean space so what riemann did was to introduce 
So, for example, if you have a surface, right? On, on each point of the surface, you have a tangent plane or whatever, a tangent plane, let's say in R three, right? So, on each tangent plane, you introduce an inner product, right? To just to measure the length of this tangent vectors or velocity vectors. So, you see, in this case, everything is, in, if you are working in a surface in R3, you already have an inner product in R3 that is the same everywhere on points of the surface, right? So, if, you're, if your surface is not sitting inside a Euclidean space, okay, there is no a priori, you are not given any inner product. So, what Riemann did was to introduce a concept of an inner product on the tangent space at each point of the surface. So, in a, of course, that has been a smooth way, right? So, when you go from one point to the other point, another point, the metric, uh, the, uh, the inner product here and the metric, uh, inner product here must be related in a smooth way. Uh, of course, that can be made precise, we will come to that anyway. So, that is what is called a Riemannian metric. Metric here is not the usual distance function, right? It is a smooth way of defining inner products on tangent space at all points of the surface. <coughs> of course, it does give rise to a metric in the usual sense, a distance function later on. That is another point, but metric here to start with refers to a smooth choice of inner products on on the tangent bundle that is, that is uh, tangent space at each point more or less you know change the whole face of geometry so there is no restriction on the dimension okay no restriction on anything so very general no Euclid euclidean thing coming in so, you can have geometries which are not Euclidean geometries. Of course, Gauss himself had discovered non-Euclidean geometries earlier. Uh, and then, of course, two other, Anos Bolai and Lobachevsky, two other people also had discovered. Gauss never published his uh, findings, but they were first published by a Hungarian mathematician called Bolai and a Russian mathematician called uh, Lobachevsky. Anyway, so non-Euclidean geometry is much, very different from Euclidean geometry. So, so in other words, Euclidean geometry is only one of a very huge collection of geometries. So, for example, Riemann's geometry was what was needed uh, for Einstein when he formulated the theory of relativity. What was needed in the theory of relativity is, was not Euclidean geometry, Riemannian geometry where you have, uh, actually you do not have a Riemannian metric, but what, is, what you call as a pseudo Riemannian metric. So you do not have an inner product, it is not positive definite, it is not even positive, right. So, just a, a bilinear form, okay. So, anyway, so much of uh, what Riemann did had a huge impact on for the development of uh, geometry in the next, uh, until now even I suppose. So, see Euclidean geometry you are to able to talk of many things, right, lengths, angles, this, that. So, all those things are not possible unless you have a Riemannian metric. So, so geometry that you do are all on what are called Riemannian manifolds. So, what we have been trying to talk about are what are called manifolds. So, manifold with <coughs> additional metric structure called the Riemannian structure. So, the astonishing performance from Riemann, just a couple of months, he came up with something very profound. And uh, Gauss himself was very happy about the 
Nimon had to give a lecture on that also to Gauss. So, so Gauss himself apparently was very happy the way Riemann had done the whole thing. Gauss is not usually appreciative of people in general because Gauss essentially knew everything more or less. Okay. So, but he was himself very impressed by what Riemann had done. So, that was a great uh, uh, <coughs> thing for Riemann. The ghost was already at that time a legend and Riemann was just uh, just an upstart at that time so to say. So, Riemann was very afraid, but he did very well and ghost himself was uh, impressed. Okay, so, the Riemann, uh, let me just say one more sentence about Riemann. Riemann published very little, but whatever he published was seminal. It started the whole branches of mathematics. Each one of them started the whole branch of mathematics. So, he basically uh, other than he, he has published something in physics also, but in mathematics he published uh, something on complex function theory that was his thesis and then he had the complex uh, I mean the geometry habilitation strip and then he had uh, uh, paper on Fourier series where he first introduced what you call as the Riemann integral now. In, in his work on Fourier series only he introduced his integral. And then he wrote a paper on the zeta function, what is now called the Riemann zeta function, which is probably one you know, of the most important function in modern number theory. So, so everything Riemann did had a huge impact on Okay, so coming back to where we left. So, just to recall what were we trying to do? Trying to formulate something, get hold of some spaces on which differentiability will make sense, right. So, for that we were trying to look at spaces which look locally like Rn. So, the obvious way to try is to say that f is differentiable if the composition of this with the homeomorphism here, so that you get a function from the disk or Euclidean space to R, that is differentiable. But then there is a problem. What is the problem? There may be another neighborhood, another homeomorphism to a ball, right. If you are going to base your definition only on a single choice of that homeomorphism, that is not going to be well defined, right. It should not depend on the choice of homeomorphism that you make. I may give one homeomorphism, you may take another homeomorphism. So, the concept of differentiation should not be changed, it should not depend on the person that is doing things. So, so you need put a put some restriction, right, some condition to prevent the definition from depending on the choice of the homeomorphism. So, the right condition is that suppose let me draw a separate picture there. So, this suppose this is your point. So, you have a homeomorphism from here to something here, you have a homeomorphism from here to something here, okay. But you want to get something independent of the choice. So, what you do is of course, both are neighborhood of the same point. So, the intersection is certainly neighborhood. 
So, on this intersection, this homeomorphism is defined, and also this homeomorphism is defined, right? So, what do you assume? So, what you the condition that you want is f composed with this homeomorphism or f composed with this homeomorphism, either both are differentiable or both are not different. If one is differentiable, the other is also should be differentiable. That only then, it, see, right? Differentiability, definition of differentiability will make sense. So, we are trying to define. You want to say that f is differentiable if the composition of f with this homeomorphism is differentiable. So, if your def definition should not depend on the choice of the homeomorphism, it should be differentiable with the other any other homeomorphism also. When does that happen? If you assume, so this you have a homeomorphism here, so we are working on the intersection now, right? So, in this case, you can start from here to here. So, this somewhere here, so you can come back to this. That is, start with only own homeomorphism, go to the patch on the surface, use the other homeomorphism to come back to Rn again, right? So, you have pieces of Rn here, you have neighborhood of the point on the surface. So, you have a homeomorphism here, homeomorphism here. So, if you draw, if you start from a patch on the sphere, on the surface, okay? So, you can come like this to one part of the Euclidean space, go back via the same part. Now, of course, you restrict to a smaller piece, the, namely the intersection. So, if you assume that this composition that is phi, if you call one of them phi, the other is psi, if, if you assume that phi composed with psi inverse is differentiable, then Right? Whether this is going to be differentiable if and only if right? If if you assume that this is differentiable, then what is going to happen? This is differentiable if and only if this is differentiable. Right? That's what we do. So, in other words, so what are you trying to do? We are trying to just transplant a piece of the surface to the Euclidean space, right? Okay? So, the way you transplant will not matter as long as the way you go from one piece of the Euclidean space to the other space is differentiable. So, this is what is this map? So, this starts from one piece of the Euclidean space that you have here and goes to So, this is a mapping from a part of the Euclidean space to Euclidean space. So, you know what is meant by differentiability there. So, these are what are called transition functions or change of coordinate functions. Okay? So, what, basically what are you trying to do? You are trying to basically give coordinates for points on the surface. How do you give coordinates? Go to the Euclidean space, look at the coordinates there, right? If your point is p, look at phi of p. Phi of p is a point in Rn, so it has the usual coordinates there. If you have another way of going to the Euclidean space, psi of p will have another set of coordinates, right? But what you are saying to say is, the way you go from the coordinates of phi of p to coordinates of psi of p is smooth. If you ensure that, the whole thing is going to be independent of the choice of the homeomorphism. The way you go from patch on the sphere, patch on the surface to equilibrium. So, but uh, there is a terminology that we used here. Probably we'll come back to this and say a little bit at the end of the course. So, any space on which such a structure is there, what, what, what structure? First of all, we have a space. Space means what? 
in a topological space. Okay, and then the first condition is this, and the second condition is this. Looks like should not depend on the way you look at it. <laughs> okay, that's what the second condition says. The way you go from one See, what does this look like do actually transforms a piece of the surface to a piece of the space to a piece of uh, Rn, right? Another choice will do a similar thing from another piece on the surface or the space to a piece of Rn. So, in a neighborhood of, the po of a single point, the assumption is that which way you go, you do, either you, you choose this choice or choose this choice should not matter, that is all, right? That is all the condition is, which is, which uh, translate to saying that maps like phi composed with psi inverse, phi is one homeomorphism from a neighborhood of P to Euclidean space, psi is another homeomorphism from another neighborhood of P again to Euclidean space. So, when you compose phi compose with psi inverse, so this is a mapping from a part of the Euclidean space to Euclidean space itself. So, if this map is smooth, there is no problem, everything is fine, right? That is the assumption. So, such a structure, a space with these two, satisfying these two conditions, locally it is like Rn and the transition functions or coordinate functions are these are the two conditions. Okay, this. What is called a manifold or a smooth manifold in this case, differentiable manifold. So, these are the proper geometric objects on which you can try to do some geometry. But when you want to talk of lengths or angle and such things, we need an additional structure that would come from a Riemannian metric that we will essentially not talk about, but maybe we will mention it some somewhere towards the end of the course. Okay. So, such ma uh, manifolds are called Riemannian manifolds, uh, smooth manifold with a Riemannian structure that means uh, a smooth choice of inner products on the tangent space at each point. You will see what the tangent space is soon. <coughs> so, so you have the Riemannian geometry that way. So, this is general di differential geometry and then Riemannian geometry. So, this this way, uh, so these objects are abstract objects, right, but modeled after Euclidean spaces locally, right. Locally manifolds, differentiable manifolds are abstract spaces modeled locally on Euclidean spaces, so that you can uh, talk of differentiability. So, for example, Rn itself is a differentiable manifold, or a sphere is a differentiable manifold of dimension 2, so on, okay. So, dimension does not matter here. What we are going to do is in a very specialized setting, like surfaces in R3, for example a sphere or a hyperboloid a cylinder in R3. So, even here, I mean what is the advantage? He, this makes life enormously simpler because, so we do not have to worry about differentiability, this is already there because you have the ambient space R3 or Euclidean space is there. You have the ambient metric, you have already have inner products everywhere. So, we do not have to worry about inner products. So, everything is there already be just because we are sitting in a Euclidean space. 
So that gives a first simplification. And even for the simplification, we are going to have, by assuming that we are going to look at only hypersurfaces, meaning surfaces which have one dimension less than the ambient space. That means what you usually call as surfaces in R3, two dimensional surfaces, what you usually call as surfaces are two dimensional objects, right? So, surfaces in R3 are in general n surfaces in Rn plus 1. So, this again gives a lot of simplification because we can talk of normal straight away to the tangent plane. Otherwise, this becomes this orientability becomes a nuisance in general. So, as long as you are in uh, setting of a hypersurface, everything is lot lot simpler. Okay, so that's what we are going to look at. Of course, most of the examples will. say n surfaces you might have already used the term like uh, hyper plane or hyper subspace in a vector space it just means that one dimension less than the whole ambient space of course so this n surface means an n dimensional surface R n plus 1. So, what is meant by dimension there will come, come to that. But most of the examples will be two surfaces in R3, ordinary surfaces. For example, a curve in R3, the curve is one dimensional, right? Whatever it means. So, a curve is one dimensional. So, we are not going to talk of a curve in R3, right? It is not a hypersurface. Of course, we have to talk of curves in, on the surface. There is a different thing. But for that matter, we are not going to talk about geometry of curves at all, just to save time, okay? We are going to look at only surfaces. But necessarily, we have to look at curves on the surface to study geometry of the surface itself. So, what is the surface? There are a number of ways you define an end surface. Essentially equivalent, some convenient for some purposes, the other con convenient for other purposes and so on. Uh, so, let us see. So, give me an example of a surface R3 good enough, some surface, give a name or give an equation or whatever, give a parameterization, some surface you know in R3, a surface, an example of a surface in R3, huh? sphere, okay, so what is a sphere? Okay, fine. Is there any other way of uh, looking at the sphere? Uh, you heard of polar coordinates, spherical polar coordinates in a Spherical coordinates huh? 
somebody spherical coordinates make a start say something and then we can add more you see just like look at the circle right we'll come back to the sphere right? so you usually write in r2 right circle as x square plus y square equal to 1 but you also write it as right parametric equation theta going to cos theta sin theta right so similarly you have the sphere also right spherical coordinates cos theta cos phi cos theta sin phi sin theta something of that kind right so there are at least two ways of describing a sphere for example or a circle one is in terms of a parameter right a parametric equation if you want to call it the other this one is what is called a level surface meaning you have a function x y z all points x y z satisfying equation f of x y z equal to some constant t so in, in the case of the sphere this is f x y z is x square plus y square plus z square c is 1 if the radius is 1 at least now you have two ways of saying what a surface is one is a level surface the other is parametric surface if you want to call it as a definition you take you can take any one of them doesn't matter actually because both are equivalent in some sense at least locally they are equivalent I will come to that so let us take uh, let us give one definition and then see that it is same as the other thing locally so let us take the first one as the definition for, for example to start with okay so how do you define a level surface you have a function f right but when you say a function you have to specify the domain and specify the co domain and say what kind of function it is okay. so we will work always in the smooth category that means we will assume that everything is smooth right function and surfaces all things are smooth meaning infinitely differential that makes life a lot simpler so if you look at this example this function is smooth okay no problem with that what about its uh, if you look at f of x y z what's what's the gradient of this of course we will define the gradient later on but so what are the partial derivatives for example if you look at of f you are going to get 2x, 2y, 2z. Okay. On the surface of the sphere, not all of them can be zero. Right? 2x, 2y, 2z. If all of them are zero, x, y, z are all zero, but the constraint is x square plus y square plus z square equal to 1. So on the sphere, at least that is on any point of the sphere, at least one partial derivative is non zero okay that means the rank of the Jacobian is one it's non zero that's what is needed okay so you say that such a point is uh, a, a, a regular you use the term regular as long as the the gradient does not vanish so what do you have you have an open set 
you have a smooth function on the open set and then you are looking at the level set of that function, right. Of course, you see this, this constant you can actually if you want you can absorb in the function itself. If, if you want you can write it as f x y z equal to 0, take c to the other side, call g x y z as f x y z minus c. So, what concept you put here does not matter actually, you can change the function to the for us, what is an n surface in R n plus 1? Is a level set all points where f is equal to c you write as f inverse c right where so you, you have to specify what f is f is a smooth function defined where so first of all specify the domain open f is smooth and at least gradient is non zero at each point that means at least one partial derivative is non zero at each point <coughs> of on the surface at least one is non zero of course from point to point it can differ right at, at a point p the first one may be non zero at a, another point q the second one may be non zero so at every point at least one of them is non zero so usually we call it as a regular surface a regular n surface is like that for us everything is I will develop on this a little bit more later but uh, give examples and so on but let me introduce tangent vectors before going further because tangent vectors may be needed for the afternoon class okay <coughs> I do not know but anyway so you have a surface all right how do you define a tangent vector at a point on the surface I will come back to this definition again later. Even on a sphere, how do you define a tangent vector? Take a point on the sphere, how many tangent vectors are going to be there at a point? Right? But at least one. So, how, what is a tangent vector at a point? How do you define it? So, you have to go back to curves. Right? So, take a curve lying on the surface and assuming that you know what is meant by a tangent vector to a curve right. So, you take suppose this is your surface ok. So, you have a point on the surface. So, what you do is you take a curve lying on the surface passing through that point P and take a tangent vector to that at that point. Of course, at the same point you will you can have any number of curves, each curve will give you one tangent vector may be the same, may be different, right. V 
at p to s is alpha is a curve smooth curve S passing through P. So, what do you mean by this? Alpha is a curve in P, smooth curve in P, pass, uh, smooth curve in S passing through P. So, first of all, what is a curve? Alpha is defined on some interval. whatever R n plus 1 in our case in general, but you want you are saying a curve in S that means the range of alpha should lie in S. So, that means alpha t is in S for all t right. Passing through p means for some t naught alpha t naught equal to p okay and then the velocity vector or the tangent vector at that point is alpha prime t naught so you want to talk of smoothness so smooth as a function into r3 rn plus 1 because we do not know what you mean by saying smooth into S, right. We, we have the ambient space, ambient Euclidean space, that is what you are going to use. So, you have a function taking values in Rn plus 1, a smooth function, but actually the range lies on S, that is the condition. So, this is what is meant by saying a smooth curve in S. So, this just says it passes through P and the tangent vector at p is p, but in, in practice it is always convenient to take the interval to be an interval containing 0, right, and take this t naught to be 0. There is no loss of generality in that, you can always translate the interval to get an interval like this. So, if you want you can write uh, this, 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 then that in terms of taking this but usually you take it to be 0 just for simplicity. Tangent vectors at a point are tangent vectors to curves passing through that point that is all. So, what can you say about the set of all tangent vectors at a point at a given point they form a vector space. I will come to this point actually I have, I have some, some I need to say something there, but I will come back to this later. So, geometrically if you look at, so here is when this hyper comes into the picture. If you look at, uh, at the sphere for example, at any point you have a normal right, namely the, the radius, radial vector. So, the tangent plane is going to be just the plane through that point perpendicular to that normal vector. So, this is true in general. So, the, the gradient is always going to be orthogonal to the tangent vector. We will come to that. Okay. So, these tangent vectors this play a very important role in the whole business. Okay. So, these are very important to understand. So, we will stop now and uh, when we start again we will come back to the definition of surfaces and look at some examples and then come back to tangent vectors again. Okay?